Well, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our carol service. Uh, it's a really special time of year, isn't it? And uh, what better way to celebrate Christmas than to come together to be reminded of our wonderful Saviour's birth and to praise him together for all that he has done for us. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Tim Gill. I'm one of the leaders of the church that meets here. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you. But before we hear our first reading and hear our first carol sung, I'm going to lead us in prayer. So let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for sending your Son into our world to save us from our sins. We ask that you would bless our time together this evening. May the truth of what we're about to sing about really come across powerfully to our hearts as you work in us and among us by your Spirit. May it be that someone is set free from their sins tonight as they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. There's going to be uh, three... Uh, main elements of what we're doing this, this evening. We're going to hear Bible readings. We're going to hear hymns, uh, carols, traditional carols sung. They were actually using recordings from previous years because uh, obviously we're not allowed to sing at present. And uh, then we're going to have a sermon. We're going to have uh, some explanation from the Bible of what Christmas is about. And uh, Bible readings are going to be given to us by two people, by Ruth, who's playing on the organ, and by Ben, her uh, son in law who's sitting over there. They're going to sort of alternate with our readings. So I'm going to hand over firstly to Ruth, who's going to read from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15, and this is a passage, it's the reason for Christmas. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put, you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his head. Thank you, Ruth. You and I are descendants of that first man and first woman, Adam and Eve. Uh, your ancestors, my ancestors, may have committed the first sins, but they were also the very first people to hear the wonderful news that God had a plan to save them from the terrible punishment that sin deserves from a holy God. So we've just heard how one day a descendant of Adam and Eve would come to earth and would suffer, who would be bruised while crushing the creature that had led the human race astray. And God kept that promise when he sent his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into our world from heaven. I hope that helps us to understand uh, our first carol that we're going to have uh, played for us, Hark the Herald Angel Sing, which uh, talks about, about what happened to that serpent, that, uh, the one who deceived Adam and Eve. 
So we're going to stand. Uh, we're not allowed to sing, but those who are watching on the live stream can sing at home. Uh, we're going to hear now, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Adam and Eve heard, heard the promise that there would be one who would crush the, Satan's head. And uh, as the Old Testament, the part of the Bible written before Jesus unfolds, there are more and more promises about that one who would come. And one of the best known of them, one of the most loved of them, is from Isaiah chapter 9. And Ben is going to come and read for us now. Good evening, everybody. Bizarre circumstances, aren't they? But uh, the truth of what I'm about to read is perhaps more pertinent than ever. Um, so uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and then 6 and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. Thank you very much, Ben. You put it in your pocket, I think, Ben. <laughs> there we go. And the lovely thing about children's toys, Lloyd, is that they make beautiful tunes, isn't it? 
Fantastic. <laughs> so we're reminded of the wonderful words we've just heard uh, read in, in our next carol, which includes the amazing truth that he came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all, and his shelter was a stable, and his cradle was a stall. And uh, don't recognize that? They're words from the, uh, the wonderful carol, Once in Royal David City. So we've just heard that he would be a descendant of David who would reign forever in justice and righteousness. So uh, let's again stand uh, and hear these uh, wonderful words, Once in Royal David City. Old Testament is full of amazing promises about uh, the one who would come, who would come and rescue us. Uh, they get incredibly detailed. We've uh, heard just, not just that he would be a, a savior, someone who would defeat the enemy, so to speak, our greatest enemy of Satan, but that he would be someone descended from the great Jewish king David. But they get as far as actually telling us where he would be born. And we're going to hear about that now. We're going to hear a prophecy from Micah, the prophet Micah, and then the fulfillment of that from Luke chapter 2. And Ruth's going to read again for us. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient time. 
and then into Luke chapter 1 chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and, he was, ex and, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. It's amazing how every single prophecy that God had given about Jesus' life before he came on earth came true. Uh, God knows everything. And as he promised, the saviour of the world would be born in Bethlehem. And uh, one very well-known carol takes up that theme. Uh, that's going to be our next carol about where Jesus was born and what happened in Bethlehem, O little town of Bethlehem. So again, we'll stand and you can sing if you're watching at home. Uh, otherwise, we're going to listen here.
So lots of prophecies. Some of them are about general things, that where he'd be born. I mean, all of us were born somewhere, so, okay, that doesn't distinguish him from the rest, other than that it was prophesied. Um, some of them, that he'd have a famous ancestor, that he'd be descended from King David. Well, I haven't got any famous ancestors, but maybe somebody here has. But uh, some of the details tell us that there'd be miracles associated with Jesus' birth. And we're going to hear about that now. Um, Ben's going to come and read from Isaiah, uh, chapter 7. And uh, then he's going to read the fulfillment of that from Matthew's Gospel. Isaiah 7, verse 14, says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. And then over to Matthew chapter 1, starting to read at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. Thank you very much, Ben. So God promised that the Saviour of the world would be born to a virgin, a miracle, and it happened just as he promised. Uh, And this miraculous conception for the worker of countless miracles himself all points to the truth that Jesus is our God made man. Uh, Our next carol uh, includes the lines, God of God, light of light, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, which reminds us of the breathtaking kindness of our God, our creator, in coming down from glory in heaven to live among us as a Chinese child. So let's stand and sing the the well-known carol. Oh, I'm not going to sing, sorry. Oh, we were going to listen, sing at home. Oh, come all you faithful.
before Ruth comes with our final reading, just a few uh, notices. It's lovely listening to carols. It'd be far nicer singing them. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, the, the plan was that we'd go out after the service because we were allowed to sing outside as an organised activity and we'd sing some carols, but unfortunately, obviously, everything changed yesterday, so we've had to, uh, to cancel that. But if you want to sing them, uh, this service is being live-streamed. It'll be on in a, a little while. It'll be, when we, after we finish, it'll be on the uh, our web... Uh, sorry, on our YouTube channel um, so you could go home and <laughs> and listen to it again and join in with the carols if you want or god willing if the, if the lord spares us um we'll be able to meet and actually sing next christmas so if you want to put a date in your if you bought your 2021 diary the sunday before christmas um probably back at six o'clock uh make a date see you then uh in a year's time and we can uh, we can sing them all um, just uh, some other services that we have got. Um, we've got a service at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Um, I'm looking at Gareth, who's our booking supremo. It was pretty fully booked, but I know various people have dropped out because obviously the change in the last few days. So I'm guessing there's probably still space left if you want to. We have about half a dozen or so. So if you want to contact Gareth, use the, the email address or ring him or just ring the church. There will be space then. And on Christmas Day, plan A, as it were, we're going to have a service at half nine and 11, but we're just checking up whether the numbers still warrant having the two services. So we'll keep you posted on that. Obviously, if you've booked, but if you want to book, please do. I think stand two services on Christmas Day. Uh, we're here every Sunday. Uh, we, we thank God that whatever else is going on, that the, the government are still allowing places of worship to open. So uh, Sundays at 10 and 6, we'll have services. And normally the, six, the 10 a.m. one is, is live streamed. The, the evening one is just a, an audio recording is, is made available on the, the website. So you'd be delighted if you'd like to join us. But again, you need, you need to book a place. So, um, But look, if that's a problem... Uh, just turn up. We'll we'll find some way of getting you in. But otherwise, ring up or respond to an e email if it's sent out. So again, it's lovely to see you. Uh, we're not even allowed to sort of stand around and chat outside at the moment. So happy Christmas uh, to you, um, and uh, God willing, might see you again over Christmas, the Christmas period. But I'm going to hand up over to Ruth. So the baby's born as promised. Who's he for? What's, what's it all about? Well, he's for people of all conditions, and famously, the first people to hear are some shepherds. Carrying on from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
before we hear a little bit more about this uh, amazing baby and the, the truths about him, uh, we're going to hear an echo of the praises of those angels uh, as we stand in here, Silent Night, which contains the, the simple yet wonderful words, Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, Christ the Saviour is born. So let's stand for this, uh, this carol. <coughs> A few minutes now, I want to sort of focus in on one of those passages that we had uh, read to us from Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 25, and uh, given it the title, God with us. God with us. Just wait till we get the, uh, the PowerPoint ready. There we are. All I want for Christmas is... Uh, well, there are plenty of answers to that question, aren't there? Um, if you're talking about answers that have been given in songs, the answers range from my two front teeth uh, of an older vintage to, to you. All I want for Christmas is you. Uh, but what do you really want for Christmas? 2020 has been an extraordinary year, hasn't it? The pandemic has changed our lives in many ways. I wouldn't have thought 12 months ago I'd be preaching with a, a sort of perspex screen around me. But on the positive side, I think many people would say that 2020 and the pandemic and all that's fallen in its wake has given them fresh insight into what really matters in life. Because it's often true, isn't it, that it's not until things are taken away from you that you realize how much they matter to you. So this Christmas, I suspect that many people, many of us, would say, while I am thankful for the presents, while I certainly enjoy the food, the thing I really wanted for Christmas is to spend time with the people who matter most to me, with my family, with my close friends. So many people across the country will be happy 
on Friday simply because they're able to be with family and friends they love. People in some cases who they haven't seen for literally months. And that is so precious. The food, the presents are just a bonus. It's the people who really matter. While others of us who have taken the decision it would be wiser to stay apart from some of the people who matter most to us, maybe we or they are particularly vulnerable, or the sudden change in the regulations has prevented them from getting together with us, we may be putting on a brave face on Friday, but we'll be really missing time with those who we love deeply. Seeing someone's face on a screen, which we've all got very used to, is better than nothing, but not much. It simply isn't the same. So I think we can put it like this. What really matters this Christmas isn't what's on the table, it's who is around the table. I think many, many people would say that they see this much more clearly this Christmas. And with that thought in mind that it's who's around your table, it's the people who really matter, then the Bible brings us wonderful good news at Christmas time. Christmas is about God coming to be with us. So to speak, God coming to sit around our table. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 says these wonderful words. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, we're very thankful to those who rigged up the, the star on the outside of the building and the, the light cascading down and then the silhouette in the window. The simple line, God with us. That's what Christmas is all about. So I've got three points this evening. Um, if you're new to church, the preacher generally has three points. Uh, and the, uh, the first one is this. Jesus, God comes in skin. God comes in skin. Matthew 1, verses 22, 23, those verses we've just looked at. You remember how the story about the birth of Jesus goes. Mary is pledged to be married to Joseph... And that was a status in their days that was sort of like in between being engaged and being married. You were, it, it, was, it was stronger than being engaged, but you weren't yet married. And during that period, Mary is found to be pregnant. And Joseph, not surprisingly, thinks she has been unfaithful to him. And he wants to end the relationship. But God sends an angel to him with a message. And the angel's message is astonishing, that Mary is conceived as a result of the work of God the Holy Spirit. This is a mir miraculous conception. Then Matthew, writing about this, adds an explanation for the benefit of us, the readers. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And, and then he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, who um, Ben read from, and also Ruth read from in another reading, who'd been writing some 600 years earlier. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And, and Matthew explains, for the sake of us who don't understand the, uh, the Hebrew, Emmanuel means God with us. That is why nearly 2,000 years later, Christmas is still celebrated by people right across the globe. This is absolutely extraordinary. God born as a man. God entering his own creation. I think uh, we've, we've learned a load of new words in 2020. Uh, some of them helpful, some of them, I think, much abused. And I, I reckon a good candidate for the most, most misused word in 2020 has been the word unprecedented. Because the reality is there have been many pandemics across the globe in history. To have a pandemic which kills many people and massively disrupts life for those who survive is not remotely unprecedented. But for God to become a man truly was unprecedented. It had never happened before and it has never happened since. Mark, sorry, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, that, that reading states two truths that together are beyond our understanding. 
those verses insist that Jesus is God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. But they also insist that Jesus is a man. Verses 24 and 25, that he's a human being. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. She gave birth to a son, a real human being. So at Christmas, so to speak, Jesus, God comes to sit around the table with us. God comes in skin. See, many of us have learned so painfully this year something that the Bible emphatically teaches, that we are designed for relationships. We were made to enjoy relating with other people, that we weren't designed to be alone, that we want people to be with us. We want to see them face to face. We want to talk with them. We've learned this year what the Bible tells us, that we were designed by God for relationships. And above all, a relationship with him. In um, John's biography, you've got those four biographies, haven't you, at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In John's biography of Jesus, there is a famous prayer of Jesus recorded. This whole chapter, which is just Jesus praying to God the Father. It's chapter 17 of John. And in it, Jesus makes this amazing statement. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you were asked what's eternal life, it's obvious life that goes on <laughs> eternally, goes on forever. But Jesus there says that eternal life isn't just about the quantity of life, it's also about the quality of life. And the things that makes life real quality, that makes life, this is, this is the gold standard life, this is life as it was intended, is a relationship with God, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus was born at Christmas so that we could have that relationship with God and have it forever. Christmas is God coming in a skin to be with us. So Christmas is good news because Jesus is God come in the skin. Come for us to have the best relationship of all, a relationship with God. But for us to have that relationship with God... He had to come and do a second thing. He didn't just have to sort of appear and say, here I am. Secondly, my second heading, Jesus, God comes to save. Uh, if you listen to that passage, you'll remember that Emmanuel, God with us, wasn't the only name that Mary's baby was to be given. The angel told Joseph of another name he was to be given. Verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. In my Bible that I'm using, the translation I'm using, uh, they occasionally try and help you out, and uh, there's a little footnote here, a little letter, and you look at the bottom of the page, and it tells us that Jesus is a, is a Greek name. Uh, Greek was the common language in those days, but it's, it's a Greek version of it, an old Jewish name, Joshua. And Joshua means the Lord saves. Hence calling him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. If we're going to be honest, the pandemic isn't the only thing putting a strain on our Christmases. Christmas with or without a pandemic is notorious for family arguments. As we look back nostalgically to last Christmas through a sort of rose-tinted spectacles, I guess we conveniently forget any unpleasant things that happened last Christmas, or the Christmas before, or the Christmas before that. Which is ironic. You know, we long to be together with those we love. We genuinely do, and we genuinely love them. But when we get together, it isn't all sweetness and light, is it? 
Relationships are so precious, but we all have that tendency to spoil them. We all have more sane moments, have more painful moments. Say, why is it that I, the people I hurt most are the people I love the most? You know, there is something wrong about all of us. I would encourage you, if you have a quiet moment over Christmas, and many of us are going to have more quiet moments over this Christmas than we expected, uh, read through one of the biographies of Jesus, uh, one of the four Gospels, any of them will do. And what will stand out for you is the amazing person that Jesus is. Certainly you will read of some astonishing things that he did, miracles, wonderful teaching, but look also at the type of person he was. Look at his kindness, his compassion, his love, his gentleness. And the way he showed all those things, not just to sort of a favoured few or to people who were influential, but to very ordinary people, to the most disadvantaged people as well. And not just those things, but look also at the way he stands up against evil. He won't follow others in mistreating people or abusing power. What a wonderful, wonderful person Jesus is. But looking at how wonderful Jesus is also rather shows up that we aren't like that. Um, I don't know if you can tell from where you are, but I, I'm actually fairly short. Um, I may try and fool myself that I'm tall, but if I stand by someone who really is tall, it just shows up how short I actually am. And Jesus is the moral equivalent to that. You know, we may try and fool ourselves. Hey, I'm, I'm a pretty decent sort of person, and we can point to people who are worse than us. But when we, so to speak, stand by Jesus, that really shows up the flaws in us. And the, the Bible's diagnosis is that that's because we're sinners. And sin isn't just another way of saying we do wrong. Yeah, yeah, okay, I do wrong. Sin is a bit more than that. It's a bit more specific. Sin is saying that we rebel against God, saying that we disobey God. It's saying that we don't believe what God says. In other words, sin is against God. And when that angel told Joseph what Mary's baby was to be called, he was to be called Jesus, he said it's because he will save his people from their sins. As I said, I, I'd encourage you, to read any of the four biographies of Jesus in the Bible. If you haven't got one, ask me. I'll find you one, and we'll put it through your door sometime later in the week. And I suggest that if you do that, you would be amazed by Jesus. That's true. But I suggest that what you'd also be amazed by, if you read one of those biographies, is how much space they all devote to the last few days of his life on earth. Um, they all devote something like a quarter, a third even, of their space to just that last week of his life and his death and his resurrection. It, it's as though they are saying to us, and they are saying this to us, the most important thing about Jesus, after realizing who he is, is that he died. That he died on the cross. Now, why is that? Answer, because this is how he saves his people from their sins. You see, we all live in perfect lives. We've all got that flaw, that something wrong with us. And that means we all deserve to be punished by God. We all deserve to die. But Jesus uniquely lived a perfect life. He never sinned against his Father. He alone did not deserve to die. But he willingly, on the first Good Friday, died in the place of his people. He took the punishment that their sins deserve so that they might be forgiven, so that they might be saved. And so this Christmas, God offers to anyone who will accept it forgiveness. That's his free gift that is wrapped up in Jesus. It's a free gift because Jesus paid for it. And with that forgiveness comes that relationship with God that we were designed for, comes that eternal life that certainly goes on forever, 
but starts here and now as God is no longer cut off from us. God is no longer our enemy, but God is our friend, our father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, is our saviour. See, it was our sins that cut us off from God. It was our sins that broke the relationship. Not a, a pandemic, as it were, that sort of separated us, but our sins. And the forgiveness that Jesus provides, the salvation that Jesus provides through his death, brings his people, all who will receive that as a free gift, all who will believe in him, into that relationship with him. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? God come in skin, come to be with us. God come to save us. But how do we know it's all true? Well, that brings me to the third and final point. Jesus, God comes to be seen. And they're looking particularly at Luke chapter 2, verse 30. You know, we live when uh, fake news is a big idea, big concept, you know, and you don't have to go any further than the pandemic. There's been loads of stuff on social media and on the internet about conspiracy theories, people who are telling you it's all, it's all just a fake, uh, that we can't believe the statistics and, uh, and so on, and there's a lot of suspicion. Also, on the other hand, about underreporting, about the number of cases, the number of deaths in places like Russia and China and Iran. You know, there, and there are all sorts of ideas on the, the internet about vaccines. Is it safe? Uh, have, people, have these famous people really had it? How do we know if we're being told the truth? Or to come to the case in point, how do we know that Jesus really was God come in the skin? God come to save? Well, if we stop and say, well, how do you know anything about things where you weren't actually there and saw it or heard it yourself? Well, the answer is you have to rely on eyewitnesses or earwitnesses. It ultimately comes down to that. I mean, these days, someone who was there probably filmed it for you and stuck it on YouTube or some other social media. But, but what about the past? What bef before people would film it or take photographs? Well, the basic way we know about events in history is that someone who was there, who saw it with their own eyes, who heard it with their own ears, wrote it down for you so you have a record. That's how you know about Owen Glendower, the Battle of Waterloo, Julius Caesar, whatever it is. The life and work and death and resurrection of Jesus happened very much in the public eye. There were loads of witnesses to what Jesus did and what he said. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present their biographies as the testimony of eyewitnesses, or earwitnesses, we might call it. Uh, John and Matthew were two of the, uh, the original 12 first followers of Jesus. They wrote down their own experience. Mark seems to have written down an eyewitness account of Jesus' close friend Peter, uh, what Peter saw and heard. And Luke was a bit like an interrogative journalist who interviews eyewitnesses and collects the evidence after Jesus has died and risen and returned to heaven. Uh, and so what we have in the, the, the four Gospels, the four biographies, and their accounts of for Jesus' birth is the testimony of eyewitnesses. Just listen to some of those verses. We heard about the, the message of the angel to the shepherds, um, Luke 2 10 to 12, which was this. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. You, you can go and see it. And, and what happened? Well, we read on, verse 15 of that same chapter. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And, and, and so off they go. They go into Bethlehem and what happens? Verses 16 and 17. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. We were told this, we went, we saw, we're telling you. They saw it. 
Well, the Magi, we, we didn't have uh, the story about them read this evening, but there's the same note. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, those three famous wise men. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. This isn't a bright idea. This is something they saw. Well, my favourite story, probably, of all the Christmas stories, is about an old man, Simeon, who's been told, you're not going to die until you've seen the promised Messiah, you know, that one that Isaiah prophesied about. And he was in the temple when the baby Jesus, a few weeks old, is brought into the temple to be uh, consecrated, uh, as the Old Testament law required. And this is what happened, Luke 2, 28 to 30. Simeon took him, that's the baby Jesus, in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Why? For my eyes have seen your salvation. Not just I've had a great idea, I've seen it. I've seen the baby, I've seen the Saviour. And the biographies go on to tell us of eyewitness accounts of his teaching, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. God coming in skin means God coming to be seen. You can believe it, it's no hoax. It's not fake news. Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus ascended into heaven. They were witnesses of all these events. And he did all that to be God with us, to save his people from their sins. So it just remains as I close to ask the question, are you one of those people? Is God with you? Is God your saviour? He will be if you believe. If you say, yes, I believe this is true. I believe Jesus is God come in skin. I believe he has come to save me. I believe I need saving. Jesus, I want the free gift of that forgiveness, that salvation. If you do, 2020 will genuinely be the best Christmas you've ever experienced, pandemic or no pandemic. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful news of Christmas that you came in skin. Your son was born as one of us. That you came, your son came to save. You sent him to save to die so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have that relationship with you. And thank you that he was seen, that this wasn't just someone had, had a dream or someone invented something, but people saw him, people touched him, people heard him. And that that has been recorded for us so that we might know it's true. Lord, give grace to each one of us, here or watching, to trust in that Saviour, to receive that free gift. We ask it in his wonderful name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have one final carol that we're going to stand and uh, listen to or sing if you're at home. Uh, joy to the world. Joy to the world.
writes, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please sit down.